for there to be any sort of successful revolution or rebellion, prior to that, there needs to be a sort of counterculture in place in order to cultivate the necessary conditions for a successful revolution. Now, automatically, most people, when you mention the word counterculture, they have visions of the 1960s. Concepts of free love, smoking pot, and dropping some acid. And at that time, this was the counterculture. But think about it, that's been well over 50 years ago now. Today, if you have the views that we do, and if you care about your blood and your ancestry and your progeny, one of the most rebellious and countercultural things that you can do is to research your own lineage and your own family and your ancestors. This is very important if you want to build a strong family. Research your family's history. Give yourself and your progeny something to be proud of. But not only that, you must live a life that your progeny will remember you by. That life should be good, but it also should include the elements of adventure and danger. So, I've been researching my family's history the last several years. And I have uncovered many things that I was not aware of the past five, six years. Now my own stock is largely Anglo and Ulster Scott. You go back a bit further, a few more generations back, <clears throat> I have some Norman French. And if you were to go even further, there's probably some Danish elements as well. There's many different resources that you can use to discover your family's heritage and past. There's plenty of resources online, but also an important aspect is actually getting out and talking to your living elders that are of your blood. You should write these things down. You should record it because a lot of this knowledge and a lot of these old family tales are sadly lost, unfortunately. And one of the most important things I've discovered <clears throat> is that <clears throat> you can, uh, as far as history books, a few years ago I found two real hidden gems. One of them was a book called Scandinavian Britain. It was written, I believe, in 1908 by a man named Collingsworth. Another one is the Danes and Nor Norwegians in England, Scotland, and Ireland. These are two fascinating books. These books were written well before 1945. You see, in 1945, there was a sort of shift. There was a sort of shift in academia at the end of World War II. These two books, what I have read of them, books like this are not written post-1945 under the current, as Thomas Triple Seven would call it, the current Nuremberg regime. And I apologize for all the noise. I'm on the side of a drive right now and people just keep falling by. I just want a truck full of Mexicans. <laughs> Gotta love modern day Ameriqua. But anyway, you know, post-1945, you don't see the books written like this, and there is tons of information that I had never heard anywhere else in both of these books. So that's an important resource. Another book I would recommend to you is a book called Finding the McCains, A Scots-Irish Odyssey. 
It was written by my friend Barry McCain, who is a musician, a prominent musician. He's played for the British Broadcasting Company before. A very intelligent man. He's an author and a researcher. And in this book, he documents his life story in trying to rediscover his heritage. Very fascinating book. Couldn't recommend it enough. You can find it on Amazon. But in this, one of the things that I found interesting that caught my eye was that Mr. McCain started going to England, uh, Scotland and Ireland, I believe back in the mid-70s. And during this time, he met up with a man named Alan Husaf, who was a very interesting figure in his own right. I believe he founded the Celtic League in 1961. He was one of the co-founders. And he also served as its general secretary up until 1984. Alan Husaf was a Brit Breton nationalist. He was born in Brittany, the Brittany region of modern-day France. He was a linguist, a meteorologist, and he also served in the Breton Parrot Division during World War II, which was aligned, I believe, with the German Wehrmacht. Following the end of World War II, and Mr. Husaf, of course, he helped Mr. McCain greatly, gave him a place to stay over in Ireland, and helped him greatly in his research. Husaf wanted to preserve and separate Brittany from the rest of France because he seen the French government as encroaching on the Celtic culture and way of life. Now, what really caught my eye, following World War II, there was a death warrant placed by the post-war French government on Mr. Husaf and several of his comrades. And he had to flee to Ireland to save his life. And Mr. McCain mentions that in this book, it is alleged that Mr. Husaf had connections with the infamous Otto Scorzani himself. And that Otto Scorzani had helped Mr. Husaf make arrangements to escape France to live out the rest of his days in Ireland. Fascinating story, because when I read this book several years ago, I was becoming increasingly interested in Operation Gladio. So, I would highly recommend this book. So what I'm telling you, this is just a sort of public service announcement to start things out with. Research your own heritage. Glean every bit of information that you can. Place names in the old country. Now lastly, this will tie into the second part of this video. I mentioned the books Scandinavian Britain and the Danes and Norwegians in England, Scotland, and Ireland. My surname there's another vehicle driving by. I apologize. I don't plan on restarting this. I want to get it all done in one take. It is obscenely hot out here today. Not very comfortable. But, uh, <laughs> anyways, there is a, uh, I want to talk about the Vikings. You know, I became interested well, let me back up a bit. My father, my old man, instilled a great love of history into me and my younger brother at a very early age. I remember being five, six years old and asking my father who we were and where we came from. And my father would say that we had the Nordic phenotype. We are usually tall, delicious blonde-headed and blue-eyed. Some of us are red-headed. And our hair darkens usually a few shades as we age. 
And I'd ask him where we came from, and he said, well, that's a more complicated question. But we came broadly from Northwest and Northern Europe. And there were a mixture of Celtic and Germanic blood. Anglo as well. And I remember reading about the Vikings when I was six, seven years old. I mean, this is well 20 years before the show came out on the History Channel. I remember writing stories about them in the fifth and sixth grade in a creative writing class that I was in. I found them fascinating. Brigands and sea raiders. These tales, and, and pagans as well, these tales fascinated me. And my own surname is an English surname. And it literally transfers, it literally translates, I should say, into one who lives in the hollow, one who lives in the holler. And that is what makes up a person. That's where I was raised here in Southern Appalachia, up in the holler. One who lives in the holler. I am Appalachia, <laughs> you could say. And my ancestors going back my surname originated, originated, I believe, in the 1200s in the Lancashire region of England in an area called Rossendale. One of the interesting things I discovered in the Scandinavian Britain book is English places that have the suffix dale. This is a Norwegian characteristic. A Danish characteristic, a Norse trait. Rossendale, Red Dale, I believe Dale might mean valley. Red Valley, Rossendale. So it's very fascinating to me. And you know, I've also broadened my horizons over the last several years to take a look into the Celtic blood that I, can, that I carry in my veins. The Ulster Scott tradition and way of life and culture that is very prevalent here in Southern Appalachia, across the South as well. And I've discovered some interesting things that I'll share with you. Recently I was watching a video that was talking about a, a burial ship that was discovered somewhere in Sweden, I believe. The details are fuzzy. This has been a month ago, so forgive me. But this Viking ship burial predates the Viking Age by 100 to 150 years. So they're now saying that instead of beginning on June the 8th, 793 and extending to the Battle of Stamford Bridge in England, in 1066, they're now considering that the Viking Age went on longer than they originally thought. And there were two peoples that the Vikings feared. Well, perhaps fear is a strong word, but two peoples who they seen a bit of themselves in, that ruthless and adventurous nature the first I want to talk about are the Balts, more accurately, the Livonians. The Livonians were raiding the Swedish coast back in the 5th and 6th century. These were a very wild people. I have no ancestry from that part of Europe as far as I know, but these were a very wild people and they were actually the last to be Christianized in Europe, there was the Northern Crusades that the Teutonic Knights conducted against them that eventually Christianized them, I think, in the 1200s, although this sort of Christianity, I believe, was a real, it was just a sort of veneer over the pagan culture and spirit. Very fascinating people. They were very ruthless, very wild. And the other people that the Vikings, I should say, had a sense of trepidation in dealing with was the Scots to their west. The Lowland Scots, but even more specifically, the Highland Scots. There's a story 
there's a story about an Icelandic trading expedition that had sailed from Iceland. There were 13 ships. And they were approaching the Scottish shore somewhere off the coast of Strathclyde. And they were approached by 20 ships. And these 20 ships were led by a man whose name was Grotyard, a very fierce Scottish Highlander. And he was a kinsman of Metcalf, or who is more better known as Malcolm II, King of the Scots, who has a very fascinating story in his own right. But as they were approached, the Icelanders had a very strong sense of trepidation. And Grotyard and his men boarded their boats and said, we can do this one of two ways. You can come, a, come ashore and we're gonna take everything you possess and we will let you sail back. Or we can do this now. We will kill you all and take everything you possess. It's a very fascinating little story I only discovered about a year ago. So see, the Vikings and the Norse, they seen something of themselves in the Highland Scots and also the Livonians, the Curonians. They seen a part of themselves. So what I, the reason I'm telling you this story is, do your own research, uncover things about your heritage that should make you proud. And that will give your family a sense of identity because these things have been attacked in academia and by modern day scholars for well over 80, for almost 80 years now. Keep these things in mind. And remember, if you consider yourself some type of dissident, one of the most dissident things you can do is to cultivate a counterculture, to save this knowledge, and to give you and your progeny a sense of pride and accomplishment that will motivate you to do great things in your own life. Anyways, tired of sweating my ass off now. I've said what needed to be said. Thank y'all for watching. Bye-bye.